Welcome to the Harry Bridges School of Labor for January 2024. This is part two of our history of the CIO. And this uh, this uh, part will be titled Organized and the Unorganized. I think that looking at the early history of the CIO and what led to its formation is a really good way of seeing kind of how we're experiencing similar issues today and how some of the issues of craft unionism haven't been resolved or they have only partially been resolved. Um, the demand for an industrial union today in certain industries, such as building trades, is more pertinent than ever. Um, and I think as we go through the slides, we're going to see just how outdated even then in the 20s, the model of craft unionism was. And we'll see that there's elements, bought off elements who don't want to see it go because it benefits them. What we will be learning today uh, this class, this session will be broken up into three sections. We'll talk about the build up to the Great Depression, the National Industrial Recovery Act, and the AFL's response to industrial union organizing. Then we'll go into organizing after the passage of the NIRA and under the Committee of Industrial Unions. And then we'll, uh, our final section will be on the first union chartered by the CAO about their beginnings, the United Electrical Radio Machine Workers Union, or the UA. Section one, the buildup to the Great Depression, National Industrial Recovery Act, and the AFL's response to industrial union organizing. <clears throat> the prosperity is, after World War I, the US industrial production increased 70%, and by 1928, exceeded the total production of all of Europe combined. In 1915, the U.S. made 895,000 cars a year. By 1920, U.S. auto manufacturing increased to 4.5 million, 4 million cars per year. Gasoline production soared by 300%. The growth of a monopoly was exponential and encompassed a great deal of American industry. By hook and by crook, Giants of industry emerged at the same time with the destruction of Europe and new investment opportunities abroad. 20 billion, that's 20 billion in 1920, was invested in Europe and their colonies by American business, or 318.2 billion in today's dollars. The common theme for most jobs in the basic industries during the 1920 was the ever-increasing production quotas, the development of quote-unquote scientific labor management, as in the case of what is known as Fordism, is characteristic of this time. <clears throat> in other words, men in white lab coats and clipboards would monitor workers to find the most efficient ways to make something up to and including making workers exert themselves to the limit of their endurances today. And you can see the same thing today with the way they're using computer schemes to increase everything. <clears throat> the scale of production needed in order to satisfy demand required such a scientific approach to organizing production. But for such plans required the involvement of board off union leadership using windfall profits from European investments who would enforce the speed up plans of the bosses the AFL under William Green had taken up the banner of Samuel Gompers and promoted the class collaboration between the bosses and the unions. The, exec the executive council of the AFL said in 1927, quote, there is nothing that the company union can do within the single union, within the single company that the trade union cannot develop the machinery for doing and accomplish more effectively. Union management cooperation is much more fundamental and effective than employee representation plans for cooperation with management. 
Then, Wayne Green himself added, quote, The General Motors Company was prepared to agree to the organization of some of its big plants as an experiment in union management cooperation, provided there would be no jurisdictional fights, unquote. And this you'll see due to the craft nature of the AFL. But with there being, being nearly 19 unions dur- vying for jurisdictional control over the auto workers and similar situations in other industries was brought to the forefront. Petty fights meant the basic industries would struggle to become organized. Dubbed, quote, the highest strategy of labor, unquote, this plan of collaboration with Monopoly meant the suppression of initiative among workers fighting for better conditions. The number of strikes over the course of the 20s plummeted from nearly 2 million a year at the start to only 19, uh, to only 230k thousand by 1929. As we will see next, the suppression, this suppression of workers will lead to a revolt against the misleaders of labor and the creation of class-oriented unions. The Great Depression. The prosperity years came to a sudden and inevitable halt in October of 1929. $160 billion in stock value was erased overnight. Wages were cut nearly in half. By 1933, with seemingly no end to the crisis in sight, almost 17 million people either only worked part-time or were unemployed. Now more than ever, the ne- necessity of a union was pushed to the forefront. Many either organized a union p- to protect their livelihood, faced the unemployment lines, or fought another way to exist. The U.S. became a living nightmare of poverty and hunger. Black Americans were the worst off, being paid an average 30% less than whites and frequently fired to hire a white person at at a lower wage. The AFL met met this extreme situation with with its characteristic concern for the bosses by denouncing calls for unemployment insurance as quote-unquote subsidizing laziness. And then now we have the National Industrial Recovery Act. Throughout this period of workers in the basic industries were trying to organize among industrial lines. We will touch on some of these organizing campaigns later in the presentation. Their efforts gained gained steam with the passage of the National Industrial Recovery Act of April 1933. The act was passed to confront, quote, a national emergency productive of widespread unemployment and disorganization of industry, which affects the public welfare and undermines the standards of living of the American people. The main provision and only provision referencing labor was Section 7A, which stated, quote, that employees shall have the right to organize and bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing and shall be free from the interference, restraint, or coercion of employers of labor or their agents. Workers struck for higher pay of... I'm sorry. That section was left in there. Should should have been taken out. While the NIRA was indeed law, it did provide the National Recovery Administration, the agency set up to administer the NIRA with enforcement without enforcement powers. For the moment, then, pending the enactment in 1935 of the Wagner Act, the rebuilding of weakened unions and the initial work on the organization of new industrial unions rested in the hands of the unionists themselves, using what advantage they could to enforce the explicit statement of Section 7A. As future events revealed, however, Section 7A did help to promote the exercise of the legal rights and liberties of working people. It ignited the spark that started the organizational engine humming in mass production. Now, the possibilities of the quiet work done over a period of four years by the pioneer industrial unionists who had pulled together a leadership core of hundreds of shops became apparent. They were on the inside. They occupied posts in the automobile plants, electrical plants, machine shops, large foundries, rubber plants, and others. 
There were tens of thousands of workers employed in these shops. As activists among them launched open organizing campaigns, new local unions knocked on the doors of the AFL, requesting support and industrial union charters. It is an understatement to describe the AFL craft union high command as being totally unprepared for such an extraordinary development. Now, the possibilities of, of the quiet work done over a period of four years by the Pioneer Industrial Union. Sorry. The craft union's fathers of the AFL confronted a crisis of unwanted children, the industrial unionists. Officials of 70 craft unions got together in a special conference to decide if there was any way out of the dilemma. The gathering was dominated by two elements in the AFL structure, the building trades department and the metal trades department. The leaders of the unions in the two departments traditionally wielded just about supreme power in the AFL. An almost forgotten clause of the AFL constitution was resurrected. It authorized the AFL high command to issue charters to so-called federal labor unions. Individual locals unaffiliated with any craft organization and directly under the jurisdiction of the AFL headquarters. In 1933, there were very few federal locals in existence. It seemed, however, opportune to issue a flock of such charters without delay to the local unions and mass production clamoring for industrial union charters. The scheme amounted to a holding operation. A local federal charter was intended to rope the workers in a given plant into a general AFL group, but only temporary. Once the workers were roped in by the federal local charter, the various craft organizations would then select their moment for picking off those particular workers, which, which each craft decided belonged to its organization. These would be the skilled mechanics of the different trades. As for the rest, mainly the unskilled, they will be left in the federal local to shift for themselves and industrial unionism as a form of organization would go down the drain. They hoped to re reap a harvest of members by cultivation of AFL lo federal locals. But out in the field, a pattern of organization was developing, which in the three years from 1933 to 1936 was to make shambles out of the craft union scheme. And just a disclaimer here, the last six slides were quoted almost exactly from Them and Us, Struggles of a Rank and File Union by James J. Matlis and James Higgins. The book can be purchased from the UE at ueunion.org. And with that, we'll break for questions and comments. Yeah, could you elaborate a bit on what the federal local is and exactly how, I guess, uh, having people in federal locals prevented the industrial organizing? It was mainly just a scheme for the AFL to get dues money without really organizing the workshops properly. Does that mean everybody from or people from throughout the country are all in it? That's why it's called a federal local? Uh, it was just under the jurisdiction of the AFL at the national level. So from what the UE was saying is that the AFL would bring in a, ho a whole shop um so it was it was like a halfway to industrial unionism so the whole shop all departments would be within this federal local it's like a, a miscellaneous local if you want to talk. it wasn't connected to any particular union but it was affiliated with the afl and then after that local was formed what the afl would do is that they would divide up the local with the other unions who would vie for particular uh, representation of uh, individual departments within the shop. So it was a way for them to uh, still be a craft union without going completely towards industrial unionism. But uh, some of the issue that why it would fail and why it would, uh, kind of killed momentum for industrial unionism is that it's like the craft unions would be incapable 
with combating the tactics of monopoly being so decentralized and, and disunified. Whereas the industrial union would have all of the workers under one contract and united. In the situation in the previous slides of 19 different unions trying to have control over particular departments of an auto plant, some unions could go on strike while others would scab them. Or some unions would go on strike and others wouldn't. And so there would be dis there wouldn't be coordination between the departments. And you would have maybe 15 people fighting against a multi-million dollar company rather than the entire plant uniting as one. And so sometimes it wouldn't, the federal local wouldn't succeed in actually organizing. Is there a um, instance that you can point to as far as the origin of industrial unionism? Can you point to a specific like plant or year and say, this is the first time where these workers were starting their like the first industrial unionism or the first industrial union, or is it not that simple or is it a little bit muddy? Or could you just point to say, oh, it pretty much sprung up in like the 1920s or something like that? Just the best you got. It goes back to the 1800s. I can't pinpoint an exact year. I know one of the earliest unions in a in a plant was uh, textile women textile workers in Massachusetts in the 1800 in the mid 1800s. Uh, I don't have the exact uh, in, that exact information on hand, though I could look it up see if I could get it for you tonight. If there's no more questions or comments. We're going to move on to the ne uh, next section. <clears throat> And this is section two, organizing after the passage of the NIRA and the Committee of, of Industrial Organizations. Uh, the 1934 West Coast Maritime Strike. Organizing the longshoremen was an example of building a union where previous efforts had laid the groundwork, but without breakthroughs. Historically, longshore work was among the worst of the worst. Heavy labor, low wages, zero job security. The old saying, quote, shape up or ship out, unquote, comes from the unsavory job options available to the unskilled labor in port towns. One could ship out on a ship's crew or face the shape up where foremen picked daily crew, work crews from desperate throngs seeking a day's work. Maybe for nespotic reasons, maybe for kickback, or as a reward for some other behavior, like riding on someone attempting to, to organize a union. This system made blacklisting easy, as well as the maintenance of racial divisions within the workforce, for examples. Union organizing had been sporadic and full of setbacks, including the widespread existence of company unions. Both the IWW and the Communist Party had attempted to organize an industrial union of longshoremen on the West Coast. The Trade Union Unity League organized the short-lived Marine Workers Industrial Union. Workers on strike were mostly members of the International Longshoremen Association, or the ILA, which was headquartered on the East Coast. Leadership on the West Coast was led by militant, class-oriented trade unionist, Harry Bridges. National leadership from the East Coast regularly attempted to undercut the strike, attempting to force business-friendly contracts. The West Coast section, which called a walkout in all West Coast ports in May of 1934, by July, company efforts to reopen the ports led to the events of Bloody Sunday, January 5th, 1934, in which two union members were gunned down in San Francisco. Their response to that was a general strike in San Francisco, lasting four days and catalyzing in the occupation of the San Francisco waterfront by National Guard. The general strike was ended with the decision to pull all questions to arbitration where the union won basically everything it demanded, including job control or the closed shop. And 
they held the hiring halls in the union hall, in which the union dispatched work crews, not the employers. The West Coast section on the, of the ILA would go on to form the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union, or now the International Longshore and Warehouse Work Union, or the ILWU in 1937. We will go deeper into the strike in a, in a session later this year. The 1934 Minneapolis Teamster Strike. Organizing and trucking is an example of building a militant, class-conscious union where a reactionary, class-collaborationist one had to that point maintained a stranglehold on further organizing. Minneapolis, Minnesota was a main distribution hub for the upper Midwest. Militant organizers within the existing International Brotherhood of Teamsters proceeded to organize the unorganized without clear permission to do so and in opposition to existing conservative union leadership and with union rules designated not to facilitate further organizing. Things started with a successful strike strike of coal, coal delivery drivers in the winter of 1933. The success of the 1933 strike gave impetus for a strike call in May of 1934 which immediately drew employer and state violence in response, which was resisted by the workers. National Guard was mobilized and police violence was intense, resulting in Bloody Friday in July 1934. If you could see, there's a pattern here in which two strikers were killed and many wounded. But the strike held throughout, through August and the mediated settlement established a strong basis of the current Teamsters, including, quote, conference bargaining. Radical leadership that came from that strike were early targets of the Smith Act enforcement. The Committee of Industrial Organizations. Founded in 1935 by John Lewis and other leaders as a defiance to the craft unionism of the AFL, AF of L. Initially part of the AF of L, but they were expelled in 1937. This was the precursor organization to the Congress of Industrial Organizations, CIO, represented by people from the larger unions like the United Mine Workers, UMW, and Amalgamated Clothing Workers, ACWA, and the International Lady Garment Workers, ILGWU. Other unions in the CIO included the United Auto Workers, UAW, the United Electrical Workers, UE, and International Longshore and Warehouse Union, ILWU, and the International Woodworkers of America, IWA. Steel Workers Organizing Committee, SWOC. Labor organization founded by the CIO and the Amalgamated Association of Iron, Steel, and Tins Workers on June 7, 1936. It was later formed into the United Steel Workers of America, USWA. The Steel Labor was the official paper of the SWOC. The first contract was signed with Carnegie Illinois Steel on March 7, 1937 for a $5 a day wage and benefits. Locally, Cleveland delegates representing 25,000 workers met at Manerker Hall on 7th of July, 1936 to plan their organizing strategy. In the spring of 1937, the SWOC scored a major victory when U.S. Steel recognized the union as the bargaining agent for employees who were members of the Amalgamated. In 1946, SWOC creates the S uh, USWA and elects their first president in Philip Murray. Flint sit-down strike, a.k.a. the General Motors sit-down strike. It began on December 30th, 1936. 
General Motors GM employed thousands of workers in Michigan at, in this time. These workers wanted to form a union to negotiate better working conditions and pay uh, under the United Auto Workers. GM refused to recognize the UAW, so the workers decided instead of walking out the plant to strike, they went on strike by sitting down at their work site. This prevented GM from bringing in scab workers. Workers defied court, uh, court orders and the National Guard by refusing to leave their work sites. Workers organized sites throughout Michigan. GM capitulated in the end to their demands. Family supported the strikers in ways like providing meals and first aid, as well as run food kitchens that sent food to the strikers twice a day. The emergency brigade was formed and they had a signature red beret warrant. The strike went on through the winter and caused a domino effect of additional strikes, delays and shortages that put more pressure on GM. GM capitulated in the end to their demands on February 11th, 1937. And as you get and see, these some images from the strike. A news clipping. And it looks to be a chorus to a song. The Little Steel Strike of 1937. This took place at the Republican Steel Plant in South Chicago. Initially, this was organized by the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, the SWOC. These demonstrations took place on Memorial Day of 1937. SWOC recently had come off their victory with the signing of a contract with U.S. Steel, and this also took place after General Motors signed an agreement with the, uh, that should be the United Auto Workers, with Autos Workers Unions. Um, but, however, this demonstration and strike turned deadly as the police fired on the crowd as they approached the plant, resulting in 100 injured and multiple dead. Um, in his autobiography, Linda Cox, first editor of the CIO News, described the Little Steel strike as murderous class war. And you can see on the right there, I uh, actually found a copy uh, from a newspaper at the time um, that covered it. And the next slide we're going to be showing um, was some actual footage of the massacre on the day that had been um, suppressed for years, but it was finally made available through a FOIA request. So there's no audio to this. All right. And with that, we will break for another round of discussion. Okay. So it looked in that video like the workers were 
running towards something or running away from the cops and the cops started whooping up on them. Does anybody have a general summary of what took place there and like what kind of casualties there were? Um, I can respond to that. So um, what initially happened was they had started organ. The workers had started organizing basically a strike and a march. Um, but there was a line of cops at the Republic steel plant. Um, when they got close, the police basically opened fired with um, tear gas, chemical warfares, and also charged with batons. And I also want to point out in the video, you may have noted the, um, kind of slight rotund black tank top shaved head wearing. They also had provocateurs within the crowd at that time. So basically people were running from the tear gas and also there were warning shots fired by the police as well, but there's still questions to this day of who fired what, but at the end of the day, about four people were dead uh, over a hundred plus wounded. And that's kind of more the officially reported numbers. Um, but it was also a galvanizing moment for the U.S. Steel organizing. Wow, thanks. I wanted to mention, just to remind people, there were three people that played key roles in the Steel Workers Organizing Committee. One of them was Gus Hall, the General Secretary of the Communist Party USA later on. But when he was younger, he was one of those people. And he was given a um, the Daily World, the old paper, when I used to get it, had a report of a ceremony that they had in, the, I think it was Detroit, where they um, gave Gus Hall an award when he was in his 70s or 80s. They gave him an award for being one of those people. So I want people here to know that that one of the three people that organized that was a me was the leader of the Communist Party USA. Thank you. Yeah, talking about that Teamster strike, um, it said they won conference bargaining. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and how it's different from just good old collective bargaining? Uh, I have very small knowledge on the Teamsters bargaining, but I do know they don't use just generic um the leadership of the union does the bargaining they have teams that include rank and file members that does the bargaining but i don't know if that's specifically so-called conference bargaining uh unfortunately the uh member that did prepare that section did not is not here with us tonight so they would be able to give a better answer Can you go back to that slide with the old mcdonald song Can I read or sing it? I've at it. Collective bargaining in our shops, C-I-C-I-O. And in our shops, it makes us strong, C-I-C-I-O. With a union here and a union there, here a union, there a union, everywhere a union. Collective bargaining in our shops, C-I-C-I-O. Thank you. Thank you. Section three, the United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers Union, or the UE, the first union chartered by the CIO. And this whole section comes from uh, them and us, the struggles of a rank and file union. The origins of the UE. <clears throat> the origins of the, of the United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers Union Date back to 1929, if the workers in a machine shop in Brooklyn, New York, experienced pay cuts brought on by the Great Depression. An organizing committee was formed representing the 200 workers in the shop and sought at first to join a local lodge of the International Association of Machinists, or IAM, but were turned away. They found a loose organization of old-timers, known as the Metal Workers Industrial Union, welcome them with open arms these these uh old timers were former members of the iam who uh got basically got run out of the shops after after the first world war because they were deemed too militant 
and they had no they wouldn't they had no organizing shops at this time. From there, the organizing committee signed up workers in their shop to the union. Soon, at the height of the depression, layoffs began to hit the shop hard, and with uncertainty in the shop, they began to branch out their organizing efforts. They began organizing shops locally, eventually branching out to shops in Manhattan and Queens in New York City, as well as Newark, Harrison, Patterson, and other places in New Jersey. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania had a local consisting of multiple shops, spreading out as far as to the Midwest in Minneapolis, Chicago, and Cleveland. Their most important breakthroughs were in the large shops of the giant corporations in the electrical manufacturing industry, at General Electric in Schenectady, New York, and Westinghouse in East, East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In all, they organized workers in the electrical, radio, and machine manufacturing industries. All of these organizing efforts were done in secret. These campaigns took place at a time before unions had a legal right to exist. Organizers were working in secret in an attempt to remain out of the boss's view. The objective was to build union conscious groups, however small, in these shops, and to do it with as few job losses as possible. Some progress in this direction was made in the years 1930 to 1933. This changed in 1933 with the passage of Naira, which we discussed earlier. The goal for these locals in the various industries was to form an industrial union in the industry and to secure a national charter from the AFL. A major issue they encountered was the insistence of AFL craft unions on their own jurisdictional claims, like we learned about earlier. The Federation of Metal and Alloy Trades. All of the groupings and consolidations of the local industrial unions had a common purpose, the achievement of union standing with the AFL. As the newly organized Federation of Metal and Allied Unions put it, as they all formed into this federation, all these locals, to labor for the amalgamation of our two affiliated groups with the American Federation of Labor, are conditions that will best serve the interests of the membership, unquote. This federation of the locals was meant to be temporary, however, it had lasting significance. Principles set down in its constitution, among them, organization of the unorganized in the industry on an industrial basis, no discrimination against any workers because of race, creed, sex, skill, religion, or political beliefs served as a as a model for the constitutional preamble which the ua ue would later adopt at its founding st as the foundation stone of its union the federation decided that as two groups aiming at the same destination would take different paths towards the afl the workers in the machine industry felt the only way they could hope to get there was by amalgamating into an industrially organized basis with the IAM, while their colleagues, the Independent Industrial Unionists of Electrical Manufacturing, planned a joint campaign with the federal locals for a new AFL and union charter in that industry. And these federal locals represented the radio workers. With this goal in mind, they met with representatives from the AFL Metal Trades Department, which included representation from the IAM. The IAM had agreed for the machinist locals to join the IAM as industrial unions. However, the AFL rejected charters for the radio and electrical workers in January 1936, instead calling for the work skilled workers to join the IBEW. As soon as the AFL's decision came down, the workers made plans for a March Convention of Independents and Federals to form a new union, the United Electrical and Radio Workers of America, their own organization, or the UE. Remember, at this time, the machine workers were with the I IAM. Just as soon as the convention was held and the new union founded, the nine former federal locals which participated in the UE convention got word from Bill Green that the AFL federal charters had been revoked. The founding convention took place 
March 21st and 22nd, 1936 in Buffalo, New York. The CAO granted a charter to the UE in September of 1936, the first union to gain a charter with the CIO. The machinists completed their amalgamation into the IAM in the same month of the convention. And in September 1936, the new IAM industrial unionists attended their first convention of the IAM. All proposals put forth by the industrial unionists were were shot down, including a proposition to put the IAM on record in support of the CIO organization drive and in favor of organizing the machine industry on an industrial basis within the IAM. A resolution that the industrial unionists had entered with the IAM with the understanding that they would go all in, skilled and unskilled, men and women, black and white, according to the basic constitutional principles of the Federation of Metal and Allied Trades. And the removal of a ritual limiting membership of the IAM to only workers with white skin. After the industrial unionists returned from the convention to the organizing field, suddenly after AFL metal, other AFL metal tradescraft unions came crawling out of the woodwork, the electricians, molders, pattern makers, plumbers, and steam fitters, sheet metal workers, and others demanding that members of their crafts organized by the industrial machinists be turned over like so many heads of cattle to the respective craft unions. Between this and pressure from the IAM leadership for the industrial unionists to collaborate with the bosses led to the machine workers breaking with the IAM. They even took with them already established locals of the IAM from Minnesota to join the UE. And at the September 1937 convention of the UE in Philadelphia, with AFL jurisdictional problems no longer an issue, the union embracing now both the electrical and machine industries became the United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America. And with that, we'll break for our last round of questions and comments. Uh, one thing, a couple things, but the first thing that I wanted to mention is that um, Ernest DeMaio was uh, the significant leader who helped in the founding of the UE. I know just because I wrote a little bio about him a little while ago. So um, look him up because he was a significant, he was basically like the Gus Hall of the UE, to put it simply. But um, if you're ever out on a picket line, and if you can see it, probably not. Oh, there it is. If you see that logo, then the UE showed up to the picket line. It's got a lightning bolt in the middle. Sorry, I, you can't see it very well. But um, when I was in um, Pittsburgh uh, at the first Starbucks unionizing there, um, I got to see uh, the UE come out. So they're very active and present in a lot of part uh, a lot of parts of the country. And then the last thing is is uh, us and them and us unionism the book that we've been using is very good and would highly recommend but there's also a little pamphlet that you can order directly from the ue that is great if you're trying to talk about industrial unionism with your co-workers because i've handed it to one of my co-workers and um the operating engineers is a craft union and one of my fellow operators would be was like oh yeah this would be great <laughs> so that's all and I could add, yes, that pamphlet is great. It it's, takes a lot of their organizing principles of the UE. And we'll get into that because we're going to do a whole class on the UE in, in the future this year. That'll be this year as well. And we'll learn more about their organizing principles then. It's uh, it's fantastic. And I could add to what's said because I've, I've handed out, at this point, uh, close to a dozen copies of them and us unionism at my job. And... Uh, those that have read it have appreciated that and they see the difference between that and what's currently going on in our union. Yeah, so um, I'm currently in school right now to become a machinist. And one of the places I applied to was actually represented by the IAM. And I was just curious if anyone knew, what is their current leadership like? 
I haven't had any interactions with the IAM, uh, but they are a craft union, uh, so you got to keep that in mind. I'm sure that they're still in that craft union mentality. What was the name of uh, um, a federal union they created? They didn't. They didn't really have a name of the federal unions. Uh, they uh, were just directly affiliated to the AFL. But they were used. They were used to siphon off the skilled workers into the crafts. With that, if there's no more questions or comments, uh, do you want to give us a brief closeout? Yeah, any words to close it out? It's still very important to us today to fight against a craft union mentality. Because so much, some of the largest unions today are craft unions. And, uh, and that's 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 on purpose um because it, it benefits the bosses to have workers that are separate that are fighting against each other and sometimes it's not immediately apparent to some uh, what the benefit of uh, solidarity is or of joining in the fight for something that um they don't they don't see uh their personal connection to and that's kind of why the craft unions um on top of their economic uh, interests didn't want to support industrial unionism they thought that uh workers in the basic industries were stupid um and i'm not i'm not exaggerating they thought that they didn't matter to the labor movement um, they thought they were beneath them. And obviously history shows that most of the power in the labor movement comes from the basic industries, from people in the mass production. Thousand, the people who are congregating in the thousands to work have the power, more so than people who work in a small shop of 15 people. And that's what we, we have to fight against is this entrenched craft mentality in, in the bought off sections of, of the labor movement that don't want to see a more class oriented perspective. And so I hope that this class is able to educate um, everyone more on where this craft mentality and this browbeating mentality is better than now mentality is, is coming from in the labor movement. And with that, uh, you could follow once again, the Harry Bridges school of labor, is put on by the Labor United Educational League. And you can follow the Lib United Educational League on various social media platforms. You could find us on, on Twitter or X at Lul underscore US, Instagram at Lul.us, and on Facebook at, at Labor United dot Lul. And of course, you can find us online at www.lul.us. And now you can find our publication at labortoday.lul.us. Uh, next month's uh, session will take place on Wednesday, February 7th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, and repeated on Saturday, February 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Right now, we don't have the topic finalized, but it will be uh, something with regards to Black History Month and uh, Black workers in labor, so keep an eye out for that. And our closeout song tonight... Uh, Join the CIO, and this this rendition is done by the New New Lost City Ramblers. I'm a union woman, just as brave as I can be. I do not like the bosses, and the bosses don't like me.